I had a book tour plan for my previous book with D&Q, which was the Department of Mind-Blowing Theories, which is my science cartoons. And I had tours in Germany, France, and North America. And all I managed was one single date in Berlin uh, as things were beginning to look a bit dodgy. And then the whole rest of my German tour got cancelled and then everything else. And then also all the events for my kids' book, which came out the following year, got cancelled. So it's kind of fun to be back on the road. Do you remember what the date of the German date was? It was sometime in March. And people were already talking about I remember I was in the train station and this homeless guy was going around coughing and shouting COVID in a kind of humorous way, which um, I guess wasn't funny then, but probably got in with hindsight less funny. I was traveling myself. I was in California and it's just, it's wild to think about. All we were trying to sort of like sneak into those last few weeks, but also yeah, just absolutely no idea what was coming. Yes, no, absolutely. And it, I was thinking of all those times when we're told bird flu or whatever is coming and those times it it was just a pain and then it sort of didn't happen. So yeah, it was it was weird. You know, I like to look at interviews, watch and, and read interviews of people that I'm going to talk to. Mm-hmm. It seemed like you really you made the virtual circuit quite a bit. You were it seemed like you were going to any uh any virtual book talk who would ask you. Yeah, well I suppose I felt I, I the, the effort of coming to flying over to America and driving around, it's great fun, but it's kind of, uh, you know, two weeks out of my cartooning schedule. Whereas those virtual things is have my dinner, sit down for an hour with somebody and then and then watch some telly in the evening. So it was it didn't feel difficult. And I kind of I suppose I felt I was helping make up for all the stuff that has been cancelled. When you're setting out for a road trip, then you, you basically have to bank a couple of weeks worth of work? Yes. I'm, I'm not good at working on the road, or, or I don't like to have to make finished work on the road. I take my sketchbook and hopefully I'll come up with some ideas when I, for when I get back. But I've realized the thing which makes me feel relaxed about going on tour is banking those extra cartoons before I go. So I I bank one for The Guardian about literature and one for New Scientist about science for each week. So it's four extra cartoons, which is a bit of a pain. But I, once I've done it, I feel few I can go on the road without kind of being concerned about these things. I was listening to one of the interviews that you did around the, the kids book that was released, I think, last year. And you had mentioned the it, it was a bit of a lengthy process actually writing it, but that you were... It sounded like you were doing some of your best work just sitting on the plane and kind of working through it. Yeah. I mean, I think there are those funny spaces of time, like being on a train, being on a plane. And when I when I don't sink into reading a book or, or watching the movie or whatever, those can be quite good times for writing, not so much for drawing on a plane, but for ideas coming. And there's maybe something about that movement with things going past the window and kind of burble of things going on around you. I kind of like to work in cafes as well because I, I it, it, it sort of stops it all being about me. I don't want too much noise, but just enough burble to kind of take the edge off my own thoughts. I guess it's different too that the process of working on a long form book, even if it's a children's book versus work, working on a single script and that there's, there's a lot of writing and editing that happens in that book specifically. I mean, they're, they're, you know, making very short strips and writing book length stories. Obviously, there's a lot of crossover in the craft of making the picture. And, and there is a lot of crossover, but they are quite different beasts. And I find, as I've said before, I find making the weekly cartoons easier than working on the long books. There's some part of maybe my attention span or my self-confidence kind of works better on short ideas. But I have this, I can't shake off this love of, of the graphic novel and the book which contains one story. So I, I keep going back, even though it's, it's harder than making the short comics. Obviously, you want everything that you put out into the world to be good, but there's a certain acceptance that when you hit a certain point and are, and are 
and are writing and creating enough things that like, obviously some things are going to be better than others. And and it's okay if a strip, maybe if a, like a strip goes out and it's, it's maybe not, you know, your best thing, it's a lot harder to deal with that in something long form and to realize that it's not working. Yeah, for sure. But I think one of the difficult things is you as the artist in the process of making the thing are not really a good judge of whether it's good or not. Often I'll have an idea which seems hilarious or, well, maybe let's just say an idea that seems funny. And as I work on it and it goes from being this funny concept that pops into my head into this concept I've been honing for a whole day, trying it with different words and different layouts on the page, you lose that that feeling of that moment when the joke came to you and it becomes this thing you've spent enough time on, all surprise is gone. But when the reader sees it, th- hopefully they don't see any of that work. And that initial surprise is there with all the delights you've added through the hard work. But you can't read your own work as the reader does. So some weeks I hand in a cartoon that I think, oh, maybe that's not such a good one. And then that's one of the really popular ones that people like. And then I look at it later and think, yeah, that was good. I was just in that paranoid state of the artist headed towards a deadline. There's an interesting process, and I don't hear this articulated enough, perhaps because it's fairly difficult to articulate, but I find that uh, there, there's a certain there's a certain way in which jokes operate in my head. You can sort of skip specific, precise language. You, you can deal in abstractions. And when you sit down and actually try to write it down, you realize that you're, you're missing some very vital elements to it to, in order to actually like translate it to another person. Right. Well, I mean, that's, I think the best jokes, and I think cartoon jokes, the, the, the thing you're really trying to do is give the smallest amount of information, which will join together in the reader's head. And that's where the joke will happen. It doesn't, it sort of doesn't have to, the elements have to be on there on the page, but the play the, for the best ones, I feel the place they come together is not on the page. It's in the reader's mind, I guess, as their eyes move over the page in a way you've set out as the, as the artist. And that is a, a fascinating possibly never endingly fascinating thing to me that I, I love that idea of making a diagram, you know, a drawing, a diagram, a cartoon, which sets off those neurons and and is funny. There's also a sense in which I assume that a having a weekly deadline can ultimately be beneficial because, you know, knowing what I do know about you, you strike me as somebody who given infinite time might take infinite time on a single panel. Yeah, I think I think there is a danger of that, or, or I don't know about infinite, but but longer than possibly longer than necessary. And yes, for that reason, a weekly deadline is a good thing. And I mean, I heard this story, a friend told me about this story about a, a ceramics teacher in a university who who took half his class and said, I mean, I, I suspect this story isn't true, but he took half the class and said you're going to spend this whole semester making one project that I will mark you on. And he said to the other half, at the end of the semester, I will weigh everything you make. And anybody who's weighs a certain amount, I will give a top grade to. So they just made hundreds and hundreds of things. And then they looked through them and there was some real genius there. Whereas the people who just worked on one single pot kind of overthought it and it it was kind of a nightmare for them. And that kind of perfectionism, I think, is the enemy. So I, tr- I, I, I try with my weekly cartoons to see it, each one as an exercise, maybe if it's not as... I, I'd, I'd rather it kind of was an interesting failure than I, I was too repetitive. And with the graphic novels, I, once I get going, I try not to be an insane perfectionist. You're sort of aiming for perfection, but also accepting that you'll never get there, which is a tricky mind trick to play on yourself. This idea of effectively telling a joke in the least number of words possible or, or, or the fewest signifiers possible strikes me as similar in a sense to the way that people talk about Charles Schultz's work. You know, this idea of boiling it down to the fewest possible lines. 
For you, does that idea of, I guess, the fewest signals also apply to the art itself? I mean, sometimes the fewest, in terms of words, to make a certain joke, the fewest number of words might be quite a baroque, over-the-top sentence that is, that is overworked. It's not, it's not always that nothing is best. It's paring it down so I suppose nothing is there that doesn't need to be. No fat. Yeah, or, or no distractions, I suppose. Uh, especially for a joke. And visually, I mean, it's always a balance. I want it to be pared down and to be minimal, but I don't want it to be cold. And I, I, I want a, a sort of handmade warmth there. So the kind of cross hatching I do, and the fact it is all drawn by hand with a a feeling maybe I'm aiming for a kind of perfection, but there's a human wobbly, wobbliness in the lines. I think that's kind of important to me. So I am paring it down, but I don't want a kind of cold structural min- minimalism. That that doesn't quite work for me. The idea of a, of a wobbly line is also invokes Schultz, obviously. Yeah. And I think a lot of that ultimately was a product of him maybe losing some of the control of, of, of his hands, uh, his hand just shaking a little bit more as he went on. That sort of non-perfect, that non-straight line, that wobbly line, is that something that you're intentionally introducing into the work? Well, I... Yeah, well, yes, I suppose it is. I don't want to make comics which look funny funny they're quite as as you say my cartoons are quite minimal and the drawing is cartoony but not gag cartoony and i like the idea maybe nobody's going to look at my cartoons and think oh here is a real infographic or here is a real diagram but they sort of play with that language and maybe on some level the funniness can kind of sneak up on you a little than if I drew everybody with kind of comedy big noses or or big shoes or whatever. So I guess I'm looking for a balance between between a kind of serious designer minimalism and a a kind of wobbly cartooniness. And for me, there's a kind of sweet spot between those two. There's also a direct contrast between... The characters themselves, which ultimately have, in a lot of cases, really boiled down to like effectively a stick figure and the complication of of the background, which, you know, I I know you've cited like Chris Ware as an influence, and and I can certainly see that Mm. in a lot of the background work that you do. How do those two sort of, I guess, divergent ideas play against each other? Well, I suppose what I like about very minimal characters and whether my stick figures are whether they're completely at the stick figure end of the sk- the spectrum or in my books like Mooncop and Goliath when they're not stick figures but they are they're still in that world of of a simple diagram of a person what what i like about that is they leave space for the audience to project onto those characters you know in in the tintin books which i loved as a kid Tintin's face is is really, I think Scott McLeod talked about this, how his face is is really dots for eyes and a little curve for a nose, but then he's driving a perfectly drawn 1950s sports car. And I guess the the reader doesn't need to project anything onto the sports car. They can just read it. But I hope that if I draw a character with dots for eyes and just give the littlest hint of an emotion they're having, hopefully I don't need to express that i can hint at it and let the audience who are probably better at it project themselves into that situation and imagine how that character feels so to different levels i'm i'm sort of giving holes for the audience to fill with their with their own ideas that's an important piece of the mcleod thing it's been a long time since i've i've read those books uh, and i i might be conflating with something else but effectively and, and certainly it makes sense in the context of a tintin book of an adventure book you know being a young child in a lot of cases reading it you want to project yourself into those characters yeah how does that work in a literary strip or a science strip i think we just there's something about a stick figure i find that i kind of Maybe because they're silly and little, I kind of have, I, I care about them. That It's almost like they, they need my protection. And as a, often bad things are happening to these characters, they're failing in some way because that's where comedy comes from. And hopefully the audience 
is in a stage between enjoying things going wrong for somebody and slightly feeling for them. And so I, I, I guess I hope people can imagine themselves into that situation by looking at a stick figure. At what point did you feel that you had really settled into a specific style? Well, when I was at art school, I was studying illustration and I was terribly worried about style in quotes and was doing that thing a lot of people do, flailing around and horribly ripping off X, X, Y and Z cartoonists and doing a terrible job of it and trying to be a kind of angsty, deep angry, passionate artist, which it was a disaster. And I, w- I was making pretty awful work. But then very, for various reasons, encouragement from friends and tutors, I started doing comics. And telling stories with comics was such a challenge that I just, I thought I'll just do them with stick figures. I'll do them in the style the simple style I'd draw a diagram for a friend or or even a birthday card for a friend. And I won't try and be an artist. I'll just try and tell stories. So I maybe on some level I thought, well, I'll, I'll figure out how to tell stories with these stick figures and then I'll become a better draftsman and, and, and flesh them out somehow. But I just found that those stories worked for me and I still want the page to look attractive and design is kind of important to me, but I I sort of got used to that simplicity. And I would say, I can't say exactly when, but I've been working for The Guardian doing those weekly strips for 17 years. And maybe the first five years I was kind of figuring it out and failing more often. And these days, I don't think I've got it sewn up. There's some weeks it's hard and things go wrong. But I, I, I sort of, I'm clear on what I want things to look like now. There's that old cliche about letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. And it, it sounds like what you were able to tap into was a removing some of the barriers, whether, whether real or artificial, that we put on ourselves when it comes to actually trying something completely new. You took some of those hurdles away by making the characters as simple as possible. That's true. And I think also just the format of, of that weekly strip where I don't have an ongoing story the way that you know peanuts or whatever does so every week it's a kind of fresh story and i don't want i don't want it to be like last week's i I want to do something different so i'm i'm it's a it's a wonderful treat that the guardian lets me kind of experiment and you know one week it might be a more classic three panel gag and then the week after it's it's a diag it's it's completely a diagram it's not it's not really technically a comic at all although these things are are so connected so i i'm i think it's good for me that that they, they allow me to have that fun so I, I'm, I'm very lucky to have that strip and to have editors who are so uh open who are some of those artists that you were ripping off in your in your terrible college phase oh boy i mean this was in like 95 to 99 so there was there was definitely Dave McKean's work which I loved at the time and I still hugely respect but I'd say my work is is gone quite far from his these days I was I loved the Tank Girl comics so I was trying to do Jamie Hewlett things you know what else I I, I guess that the, the thing I was trying most of all was that Dave McKean type cartooning because it felt like the cartooning one ought to be doing in an art school. It felt arty. And I, I, I think he's brilliant at what he does, but I learned from trying to copy that and realized that it didn't add anything to my work. And sort of, I was self-consciously collaging things for no good reason. And I sort of brushed that off when I started getting more into the stories. And I think that was probably for the best. It was comics work at the time. Yeah. I mean, a, a big, a big discovery for me, as I've said often, was, was Edward Gorey's work. Because for me, that filled a gap between the illustration work that I was doing and the comics that I loved. And what I felt with Edward Gorey was he had a wonderful way of taking what he needed. If he wanted speech bubbles for one of his books, he'd take them If he decided instead it was text below the images, he'd do that. But it always felt like him. 
and he was making these weird picture books for adults. So I felt I kind of got a license from that to to start making comics without feeling I had to use every tool in the toolbox or or be a, a a Dan Klaus or whoever who who was just doing these perfect comics. I could do my own weird side version. And I was making self-published things, which were definitely inspired by Edward Gorey more than anyone else. I'm always really curious for people who went to art school, especially at a time when comics weren't taught as widely as they are now, how useful those years were for you and ultimately what you, what if anything you, you took away and continued to apply to your work? Well, I think it was immensely useful to me. And I think it wouldn't necessarily be for everyone, but I, I think the timing was great because while I was at art school, those early great Chris Ware comic strips were coming out and Dan Klaus's stuff was, was, was hitting new heights and my tutors weren't the tutors who I think maybe of the generation above me had who who were completely dismissive of comics and you really had to fight against that. I had illustration tutors who were in love with Chris Ware's comics and inspired by these people and and uh, and and you know the college library had had comics in it and I di- I didn't feel I had to fight against against authority there so it was great from that point of view and of course you know this was more than 20 years ago in Scotland where I didn't pay a penny to go to university so it wasn't it was all covered by the government in those days so it it wasn't a choice of oh boy I'm going to spend all this money and learn how to do a cartoon how to do cartoons which I guess these days you might feel differently about so I I I loved it and it was just that feeling of being surrounded by creative people all day long was great. It was clear going into university that you that this is what you wanted to do for a living. I wanted to draw pictures for a living. I think as long as as long as I can remember drawing has been my favorite thing to do and you know I will just sit and doodle and it doesn't that part of it doesn't feel like work moving a pen over a page and drawing what comes into my head. If there's no time pressure or reason, I can do that just for pure pleasure. So when I realized that could be a job or some kind of artist job, then I I went to art school. But I didn't intend to be a cartoonist. I didn't. I thought writing your own stories was. I don't know why I just I I, when I started, I just couldn't I, I couldn't imagine doing that. And I was always looking around for a writer who I could adapt or I, I guess I, I was just fearful of taking that step of of writing words. And I, I think it took me a while. Even now I'm I'm probably more comfortable with the with the drawing part than the writing part. I think it's it they've evened up more, but draw I I, I certainly know with a comic that I can make it look good in the end. Uh, and the hard part really is making it interesting or funny. Yeah, the adaptation, I think, continues to run through your work in some sense or another. You know, you mentioned the Goliath book, which obviously taken from the Old Testament. And there's a, it's not a one to one, certainly, but, but in the literary work that you do, there, there are, there are certainly elements that you're pulling from existing works. Yeah. So uh, there's an extent in which it's still integral to what you do. I think all my books have, and my cartoons, often I, I like to bounce off an existing thing. I mean, Goliath, as you say, bounces off the Goliath story from the Bible. Mooncop really bounces off all the sci-fi movies or many of the sci-fi movies that I love. And I think part of it, part of when you read Mooncop, I, th- I hope the interest is that it's so different from a lot of the action-packed or um, exciting sci-fi stories you read. And my kids' book is kind of playing off the Grimm's fairy tales and those other fairy tales. So there is some some part of me, maybe it's the habit from doing these weekly cartoons, but I like bouncing off existing things and, and having my work exist in the space between between itself and between the audience's 
maybe expectations of it. What was the genesis of the literary work? Was that really the Guardian approaching you? Or how did how did that come about? Well, I had I kind of had some amazing good luck and good timing there. I went to see the Guardian with my illustration portfolio. A friend of mine told me the art director's name and I phoned him up and he he said, sure, come by with your portfolio. And I showed it to him and he said, this is great. I like the illustrations. I like the comics. If I, if I can use you, uh, I'll give you a shout, but we don't have anything at the moment. And then I did a couple of illustrations for him. But at the time, they had a literary comic strip by the great British cartoonist Posey Simmons, who was doing her literary life cartoons, where she got really a kind of ha- a, quite a big space. I guess like half an A4 sheet of paper where she she did these one-page stories about literature. And then she asked to take a sabbatical for, I think, eight weeks to put one of her graphic novels together. And Roger Browning, the art director, called me up and said, did I want to take over from her for eight weeks? And at that point, all I'd done was art school, a few illustrations and some self-published zines. And suddenly I had like three weeks to come up with a pitch and eight cartoons to fill one of Britain's most beloved cartoonist space. So I was completely terrified. But I managed to come up with with a concept for some strips, which were about writers trying to write and then failing. They were they were in the end reprinted in one of the one of Sammy Harkham's Kramer's Ergots. And I was happy with them. And and again I think the I wouldn't have pitched that idea to them if they hadn't asked. I'd have I'd have been terrified. But suddenly I had three weeks and I just had to do something. And I think my work took up took a step up there. And then when Posey came back, they found me another job, which turned into the, the thing that I've been doing weekly cartoons for them for 15 years. So I kind of have her to thank for everything, really. In effect, write what you know. The story of a writer who can't figure out what to write was it's very close to home. I didn't think about that at the time, but obviously I was just channeling the the tension and the pressure I felt into my into my pitch. And I had to come in and pitch it to the editor. And I said, I had a few sketches and I said, so it'll be a famous writer and they're trying to write and then nothing really happens. And the editor kind of looked a bit shocked. And the art director said, Tom does nothing happening very well. And she was like, okay, well, let's give it a try. So I was... I was lucky that he was on my side. So that was great. So a little bit of Seinfeld in there, it sounds like. Maybe, yeah, yeah. What does that mean that nothing happens? And what does it mean to do nothing well? Well, I think comics are really good at nothing happening, things dragging, quiet moments. I think in a movie, you can only have something like that happen for so long before the audience who is stuck in the time it's playing at get annoyed. And in a book, I guess you describe it, but it's kind of telling rather than showing. And in a comic, you can just make those quiet moments interesting and you can add things. And because the audience can choose to read it at their own pace, but still get the information, I think you can make quiet moments really quite beautiful. I, um, there's a British cartoonist called John McNaught who does books which are not nothing but quiet moments but i i for, I, I think he's a wonderful example of 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 quiet of of the quietness that comics can have it makes a lot of sense to me when discussing something long form you know and this idea of like almost like earning the quiet moments but how does that play into a shorter strip well it's difficult and it's one of the things i enjoy about the longer graphic novels is that feeling of oh this needs two more quiet panels before the before the end of the story and in a graphic novel you can just do that or you can put in 25 more panels before the before the final thing but the in the short strips there's rarely space for that i've sort of you know I, I'm quite happy to have small panels there, and sometimes I can squeeze in longer pauses before punchlines, but that's trickier to do. I guess you can break up the space with the way you use the text and with the the way you pull away from the characters or zoom in can have... I, there's not an exact mathematics of what it means, but 
I can, I, I, that's one of the things I enjoy is, is playing with those things in my notebook and in pencil versions and just trying to get the, the joke just right. So the, the, the technical cartooning stuff does everything it can to help the, the initial idea. The Guardian strip, as, as it stands now, is more of a direct product of the conversations that you had with the editors after you moved on from filling in for Posey? Well, after I filled in for Posey, I did what was supposed to be an illustration for the letters page. And I realized the space was just big enough to squeeze in a cartoon. So I, the first few I turned into cartoons and they kind of liked the fact that I was doing that and they gave me a little more space. So I managed to sort of push the walls out of what they'd given me and I got just enough space to, to do a cartoon. But in the early days, the cartoons had to be pegged to a letter that had been written to The Guardian. So some weeks it would just be, they'd have a really interesting letter, which they loved, but was, you know, about something intensely obscure. Or for example, if a famous, like if Harold Pinter wrote a letter to The Guardian, whatever he wrote about had to be the focus of my cartoon because that was their lead letter. So some weeks I would just get thrown absolute curveballs and have to make cartoons about insane subjects that I'd never have chosen. And some weeks that was great and pushed me to make a cartoon about something I, I wouldn't have thought to, but some weeks it was an absolute nightmare. Uh, and over time, as people started to write fewer letters to newspapers, they they kind of canned the letters page and allowed me to carry on and just kind of find my own themes from the world of literature. So now I just, sometimes the editor will say, you know, there's a big new book coming out next month. Maybe we could have something about that. But it's pretty up to me what I what I do. It's a double-edged sword, right? Having to tie it to something specific in that, as you said, certainly in some cases, it can be nearly impossible to figure out what to put down on paper, but also at least, you know, what you're, to a certain extent, you know what you're doing every week. Oh, absolutely. That, 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 that's absolutely true. And, and the, the, the kind of openness now for me can feel like a burden at times. I mean, I like, I quite like restrictions. I like the fact that I have this small space, which is the same size every week. And, and if I have a bigger idea, I have to figure out how to chop it down and make it work there. And that, that helped focus and when I got those themes, I think it was, it made it made the good weeks easier, but it made the bad weeks so much harder. And it also meant I ended up with a load of cartoons that I couldn't put in a book because they were just so weirdly specific and pegged to some insane topic that they they would have just been confounding to an audience. So I think on balance, it's better the way it is now. But it it does mean there's some weeks I'm spending all my time trying to think what the cartoon should be about rather than what it is. The work that you have been making for The Guardian is is immensely shareable online. I talked to um, one of your, uh, I guess, publishing mates, uh, Kate Beaton, um, oh, yes. a couple of weeks ago, and she really found success with the Hark of Vagrant stuff because it was, it was, so, it was so highly specific mm. to, this, to um, these history stories these history um, gags, and it was also really shareable. And I think both of those things really do define the work that you've done for The Guardian. Yeah, well, I, I, I love Kate's work, and I really, I really love Ducks, um, which I was very lucky. Drawn and Quarterly sent me a copy of early, and it was wonderful. So I was so pleased to see that all the charm of her humor comics was still in this kind of thoughtful, brilliant memoir. So I thought that was wonderful. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think the shareability of these cartoons, which, you know, is kind of just good luck because I was doing them before Twitter and Instagram. And I think I guess Kate was Kate's stuff was being shared on or, or kind of more on blogs and live journals. Tumblr and yeah, yeah. places like and that. I, I think that the the extreme shortness of my comic strips means they kind of work on a on 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 the twitter on the twitter scale which i think even a, even a one page comic is probably harder to share but these tiny little ones work there and I, I i very much think of these comics as having three lives you know the first life is on the page amongst 
book reviews and in this very booky world which Guardian readers have specifically chosen to read. But then there's this second world where they go into the internet and are kind of cast into this insane tumble dryer of a million things all happening at once and somebody's sharing these cartoons next to somebody else's political views. And they're kind of away from that book world. And, and I sort of want them to be able to survive in that world. So I don't want them to be overly um, inside baseball bookish. I want them to be possible to be enjoyed by a general audience. And then the third life is when they kind of come back together in the book, as, as we've just done, and I can have fun of designing it and thinking how they play off each other and ordering them. And, you know, the thing I always loved about Gary Larson's Far Side cartoons, which were a big influence, was, you know, sometimes they didn't even have to be that funny on their own, but they were funny because you were coming back to his world and you, you'd you read a bunch of them before and they, they played off that. And I think in books, cartoons can can play off each other in a fun way. I was thinking about this a while ago because I, you know, I encountered an old far side strip online and, and it occurred to me that whether intentionally or so, he was really ahead of this curve in a really interesting way where he would do the best example I could think of is that, you know, the, um, the Freudian slide comic where it's like a baseball comic with Freud like sliding into the base and right. with something like that, you know, you know that that's going to have a second life in PowerPoint presentations, or you know yes. that, and, and that relates back to what, what Kate said. She said she was having this this surprise success because there would be history professors who were, who put her things on the wall. Yeah, there's an interesting way in which that work really presaged what you're doing, the second life that you're having. And I'm really curious if he was aware of that, and if there was a certain way in which he was really kind of playing for the crowd. I don't know. I think. I think when you, when you make these cartoons, when you make a lot of them, then you're, I guess you're you're you you you're the things you love come out, and his scientific nerdiness and kind of love of science comes out. And I think with me, it's the same thing. I mean, before I talk about me, the the, the thing I think was amazing about the Far Side is, I think you read it now, and you, the world has caught up with Gary Larson. It's not as insane as it was because that humor has gone into the mainstream now and i don't think you read gary larson and get how mind-blowingly unexpected and strange it was to find that in a newspaper when i was reading it as a teenager i feel it's i look at them now and think yeah they are funny but they're funny in a way lots of things are now but then they were just totally unique and i think that's why i loved them so full-heartedly and why why I find them so inspiring. And now I look back at them and I can see that, but I don't I don't feel the same the the, the same things about it. But in in terms of weirdly specific audiences liking your comics, I I definitely get that. I love I love it when I do a slightly weird comic about a writer who I'm thinking, oh, maybe maybe this person is 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 on the edge of being well known enough for one of these cartoons, or or I think, oh, this is this is something I do with books, but maybe nobody else does it. But then you do it, and you find that the audience, there is an audience for that thing, and they're particularly excited because it's it's unexpe- an unexpected thing to talk about. So I, I'm always delighted when fans of a certain writer writer get in touch or when a scientist gets in touch about one of my science cartoons and says can i put your incredibly silly cartoon about geology on the front of my lecture about geology to phd students i'm i'm always immensely flattered and always say yes immediately when that happens and that's kind of why my book's called revenge of the librarians was i realized whenever i put librarians in a comic it just went wild on instagram and twitter the the librarian world, they just, they're all on there and they're all in groups and they love sharing things and everybody's so positive and it's really charming. And I just thought, oh, that it would be fun to, to kind of salute librarians in some way. You were cognizant of the fact in the design of the book too, there's this really nice touch where it has the, the card in the front. Those are 
But I mean, in your position doing what you do, like that's a group of people you want to make happy. <laughs> that's a that's a group of people you want on your side. Although I was in Paris promoting the book and a bookseller came up to me and said that I should have called it Revenge of the of the booksellers because she said a librarian will only buy one or two copies of the book and we could buy hundreds. And I thought she's got a point. But then Tom Devlin just reminded me my last collection of cartoons when I did a collection on postcards was called the snooty bookshop. So I I kind of have done that already. You sort of alluded to this in the context of what Gary Larson was doing, but did the science strips spring out of, as you said, your own nerdy interests? In a way, I mean, that they appear in New Scientist magazine. And I, I didn't study any science, but my grandfather was a marine biologist and used to get New Scientist every week. And he would give them to my dad when he was finished with them. So they were always around our house. And I started making illustrations for New Scientist from time to time because their articles often are about, you know, conceptual things, which there isn't, there's only so many photographs of people frowning that you can use before you know you want you want some, something more so um they're they're good at using illustration and i was doing illustrations for them and enjoying reading the articles and 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 trying to come up with something and i just wrote to the art director and on a whim really sent him a book of my mini comics and said if you ever want a weekly comic strip give me a shout and the next day he sent an email saying because I thought it was a bit strange that a magazine like that didn't have a weekly comic strip. But I didn't imagine he'd get in touch. I thought he'd say, oh, we don't want one. It's fine. But thanks for offering. But instead, he got back and said, yeah, I spoke to the editor. If you do 12 of them, we'll pay you for them. And if we like them, we'll we'll give you a weekly strip. And I sort of, a little bit like the when I started The Guardian, I sort of then panicked and thought, who am I to be writing cartoons about science for an audience of scientists and science enthusiasts and I sort of had to go on a a bit of a science boot camp of just listening to more podcasts and reading the magazine and a little bit like with The Guardian not so much accumulating facts but just building up some places for the ideas to come from more than because you can always check the facts and I can always email someone at the magazine and ask them uh, for some specific detail but it's it's kind of finding the the interest is is the tricky part. So that's part of my work is um, not not staying up to date and of finding information, but just kind of finding things that interest me. I've spoken with Mary Roach a few times. She's not a scientist. She doesn't really have much of a science background. And I think that there's a way for her work in which that is almost a superpower because at very least in the process of learning these things in order to write about them, she's able to really translate them to, to readers. Scientists writing about science, a lot of things are assumed. You you kind of get caught up in your own head and things like that. And I I wonder if for your own work, when writing about this field that in which you have no formal study, whether or not there is, whether it is a bit of a superpower to not be a scientist. I, I see what you're saying, and I think I think yeah, there is some of that, and I think that the New Scientist is a popular science magazine, and there will be a a run really of um, people like me who read it just because because of, of a vague interest in science, up to possibly very important scientists not reading to get information about their own field, but who want to stay up on things and may be interested when something in their field appears there. So there's a wide spectrum of of different amounts of science ability. And I certainly don't want to make any of my cartoons for the reader to feel, oh shit, I can only get this if I've if I've studied this in college or if I've read that book. So I'm I'm trying to play with these nerdy specific subjects without them becoming a barrier. And the other thing I realized as I worked on it is a scientist and an artist are not actually that different. You're probably slightly too obsessed by what you do. Your self-esteem is maybe a bit too much caught up in your job. You're trying to create new things. You probably need somebody to pay you to do them. There's, there's so, you know, you, they both often want to be published. There's so many things in common that some weeks I come up with an idea and I think with a little tweak to the kind of clothes that this joke is wearing, it could it could go either way. Are you working or or sort of ruminating on anything long form at the moment? 
I'm ruminating is, is exactly the phrase. I'm ruminating on a new graphic novel. I want to do a third book like Goliath and Moon Cop. And I'm in the worst stage for me that trying to decide on the project, trying to, I sort of see it's a little bit like making a snowman. And the first stage, you've got that pathetically tiny ball of snow and you're hunched over trying to get it to turn into something bigger and your back's sore and it kind of seems pointless. And later when it gets going, you're you're picking up loads of snow and then you're just shoving in all the the bits of coal and the the carrot nose. And that's all kind of fun. But that first stage of getting started and really I think the hardest thing is for me to persuade myself that it's a good idea. Because once I believe in it, I can make other people believe in it. But I find that really hard at the beginning. So exactly as you say, I'm ruminating hard. And I, as as I say, I'm I'm in Detroit at the moment on a tour and I've got various European dates when I get back, which is quite a good time to mull things over. And then hopefully when I get back to my desk, I can... Um, I can get started on some real, some real work. <laughs>